Wow. What an amazing documentary. I got a chance to preview Heather B. Because mm-hmm. I know people. <laughs> it's called Stand, um, premiering tomorrow, streaming on um, on Showtime. And it's about a person that I've always known. Mm. I've known this man since the 89, 90. Wow. I've known who he was when he played high school. He rang bells in high school. Um, he was easily regarded by many of us. When you play basketball as a youth growing up in Oakland, you was you would call out the name of the person you thought you were. And we would call out his name, his former name, um, when we would be on the basketball court. Some people called out Jordan. Some people called out, you know, Magic. We called out his name. And as he went into college, he went to LSU, got a chance to play with Shaquille O'Neal who said that he once witnessed him play the greatest game in basketball he ever seen. Shaquille played with Penny, played with Kobe, played with Dwayne Wade. He even said, uh, even played against Michael Jordan, but he never saw anybody play a game as phenomenal as this man has. This man stood on his morals. This man stood up for truth, and he didn't let his truth be smothered by uh, corporations of other people's ideologies. And for that, he may have suffered. He could have had a longer career in the NBA had he chose to reform or not even reform, uh, conform. Um, But he chose to stand on his square, um, and which makes him even greater. That's why Muhammad Ali was great. It wasn't just what he did outside the ring. It was the person he was, I mean, what he did inside the ring. It was the person he was outside the ring. That's what makes him great. It's not what he just did on the basketball court. It's what he did off the basketball court. And I want to welcome him to the show, the one and only Mahmoud abdul Rauf. Give him a big round of applause. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Man, bro. (laughs) Jeez, man, Shaq said... He never saw, he played against, Shaq said you, you played the greatest basketball game he believes in, in, in basketball history. Sheesh. That's Shaquille O'Neal, a goat in his own right. True. How does that make you feel? Look, man, I'm extremely grateful, yeah. you know, especially with your colleagues, yeah. you know, saying things like that, man. Uh, I'm humbled by it every time I hear it. Cause he was a he was a force to be reckoned with, like you just said. He's mm-hmm. a Hall of Famer, yeah. Mm-hmm. And especially coming from a guy like that, and all the people that he played with and against. So, uh, a huge, I'm, I'm uh, a huge sense of gratitude. Yeah, y'all didn't all, y'all didn't get along when he when he first <laughs> came to LSU. What happened? Who? You know, I, you know what we we got along, but you have your cliques. You have people, and and we worked together well. But there was an incident that he felt that I uh, didn't pass him the ball intentionally. <laughs> and uh, and he Jack. said something. He said something to me. And look, man, I'm I'm a quiet guy, but you push my buttons, uh-huh. so I went back at him. And I'll come down and not pass you the ball just to prove a point uh-huh. uh, until you, you humble yourself. But we had a meeting with Coach uh, Brown after that, man. And Coach basically told him, he said, "Look, this is his his team. If you want to get it off the glass, wow, get it <laughs> off the glass. Wow, <laughs> that's what wow. he told him." <laughs> the thing that I didn't mention is uh, my mood was diagnosed with Tourette's. Mm-hmm. Um, at what age? I was diagnosed in, in the 11th grade. In the 11th grade. Yes, but I, I had symptoms from elementary on. I used to have blackouts mm-hmm. where I would just, you know, they said it looked like I was going in a seizure and someone would have to, you know, touch me or something to, to wake me up. For years, my mother thought that I wasn't listening to her. I would hit slap across the face, but didn't I tell you? said, Mom, I wasn't asleep. And she would send me to the doctor, and then when she found out, it broke her heart. Uh, you know, because she had been punishing him for things yeah. that I didn't even know. But then it turned into the the intense tics and vocal tics, and and that, that started also in elementary. That started. The way he described what it feels like, you described this in this documentary, I mm-hmm. I felt the pain, like oh, yeah. the way you described it. Many people thought, even in the draft, that because you had Tourette's, it would hinder your ability to play in the NBA. And you responded by saying, "Look, uh, if anything, it enhances it." You know, I remember you uh, before the NBA. I mean, I just came out of college, man, thirty point two, twenty eight a game, and I'm talking to these NBA guys, and they say, "Hey, does it affect your play?" I'm like, are you serious? Have you not been <laughs> watching? Watch yeah, I, I felt offended when I when I heard that. But yeah, man, without without Tourette syndrome, 
I mean, I, I always grew up to be respectful of people and stuff like that. But when you have something like this that's in your face, it, it, it helps you to be more sensitive and sympathetic and empathetic to people because you can't hide it. Mm. But also, Tourette's pushed me where I myself wouldn't have gone without it. Yeah. I wanted mm. to stop after an hour and a half, two hours. Uh -huh. But it was like, no, you got to do this. You got to make 10 more. Why are you tired? The move you make prior to making those 10 can have no glitches. And they have to all be net. And if one hit, if I mean, if one hit the rim, I can have nine in a row, ta -ta -ta, and I'm, <laughs> I'm breathing hard. I'm, I'm about to die every day. And if it, the tenth one skims the rim and goes in, I can't retake the tenth shot and say, ten. I have to start back at zero. So that may take an hour and a half. If I'm walking off the court dribbling, if I mess up, I have to come back ten steps. I'm on the goal again. My mind is telling me to shoot it. I'm like, man, I don't want to shoot it because I know what's gonna happen. So I would have to do that drill sometimes twice in a row after the f first hour and a half, two hours. So that's another four hours because it's going to take about an hour and a half to finish 10 in a row going full speed. Wow. And so every day was a day like lit. I said, man, I got to find a way because if I don't, I'm going to die. So I, I started after that first, after that hour and a half, then I do that 10 in a row. When I get the ball, I would throw it towards my house. So now when I finally got it and I'm dribbling and it don't feel right, and I back up 10 steps, I'm not under the goal to shoot. I can get home. Oh. And that was every day. Wow. wow. That, but that made you practice over and over and over and over mm -hmm. again, which contributed to your skill set. Mm -hmm. You tell a story in a documentary. I don't know if it was a, a high school basketball camp or a college basketball camp that Michael Jordan <laughs> showed up to. Yeah. Now, you know my mood. You my dude, bro. I go, you know, <laughs> you my man, 20 grand. But you said you shook Michael Jordan. At, at, were you in high school? or I was in high school. Mm. Nike camp in Princeton. At Nike camp. That's my guy. I mean, you know Mike's my guy. I have to tell you, we took pictures together. <laughs> Not we, you. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Will he vouch for this story? Oh, yeah. Uh, he, he knows. Look, there was, a, there was a guy. I can't remember his name. He, they say he was the toughest scout ever in, 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 at the Nike camp. He had never given one a, a five. That was his highest score. And two years in a row, he gave me five. And Jordan came, and that's when Jordan, when, the way I tell a story, and it's true, Jordan was like, I'd never seen somebody as cut as him. Mm. Yeah. And he's so close, I can reach out. I'm at the bottom bleach, I can touch him. So I'm just admiring his body. I'm like sizing him up, not in an arrogant way. Mm -hmm. but this is how you're supposed to look. And then he was black with lotion on, so you could see the fibers in his legs. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and, <laughs> you know what I mean? If you could just see it. And out of all the people there, he calls me. I get on the top of the key, left hand side, and he gives me the ball. He said, Look, I want you to come at me with everything you have. I'm gonna try to stop you. I said, Okay. And I remember getting it and I gave him a quick jab to the right, took off left, and I took off. And if I would have went straight up, he would have had it, but I ran through, I took something off of it, scored. People went crazy. My insides were going crazy. Yeah. But you know, when you do things in front of people, you don't want them to know you were surprised. So I kinda walked off like I do this all the time. <laughs> but then he gave me the ball back. He and this time he dropped it in front of me, but I didn't establish a pivot. I had my right in front of my left, and I grabbed it. I went through my legs. I leaned. He bit. I crossed him over, and I laid him up. It came out the hoop. He said, uh, he asked me for the ball back, and he told me to go sit down. And when I sat down, man, I'm sitting there. I'm like, with myself, I'm like, man, I just scored on Michael Jordan twice, <laughs> and it was easy. And I couldn't wait to get home to tell my boys, but that, that motive, I said, man, I'm on to something. Yeah. The way I'm training. Yeah. Yeah. But I, now I didn't guard him. No, of course. Now he would have dumped all over you. It would have been easy for him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say that. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's amazing. It is amazing. I, I look at you, big fan, by the way. Thank, Thank you, so, you much. so much for being here today. And I think about sports in general. We were speaking about, shout out to Rod Strickland because we were talking about him earlier. Love Rod. Gary Payton. His family. Yeah. Jason um, Kidd. Um, Antonio Davis. I grew up with Antonio Day. I have to shout out Antonio. That's my brother. I'm sorry, Mamu. I'm just, you know. The point I'm making, okay. Rod Strickland. These are people who I met, I'm saying. Damian Lillard um, as well. I want to shout him out because you guys have such humble personalities. Mm -hmm. Like, just great at what you do. 
and but so humble mm. and it, it's almost like somebody would walk right past you mm. and you know and not in a disrespectful way mm. but it's the way you carry yourself but it seems like the league itself it, the nba is made for like big stars you mm. know people with the over the top personalities mm. the yappers the loud mouths did, did it ever feel out of place for you like with all your greatness but your personality seems almost to be the opposite that's, that's a great question you know when I wasn't practicing, when I wasn't playing, I was just in the streets. I was at the bookstore. I was hanging around what we would call regular people. Mm. I didn't I didn't go out. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I was, and it's nothing personal. It's just not my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So mostly everybody I hung with would just like had regular jobs at the airport. Mm -hmm. You know, just regular people. And I just felt more comfortable around in those setting. environments. I just, because sometimes with wealth, sometimes, not all the time, people change. You know, they start carrying themselves differently. Mm -hmm. And so I find oftentimes when you, you, you're with people in the margins and the peripheries and the bottom, they tend to keep it a little bit more real in their conversations and the way they do things. And I've always been attracted to that. Mm -hmm. And I've always been attracted to players. That's why Dr. J for me was my, not just how exciting he was, but he always carried himself with humility. And mm -hmm. I'm always attracted to people like that. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Um, Tracy, Thank you, you jump for in answering that. Thank, Thank you. You. Mm -hmm. you know, Mahmoud, hearing you speak, it brings to mind Chadwick Boseman, mm -hmm. who was incredible in his gifts. And, you know, the entire cast and director for Black Panther, they said they had no idea that he was sick. But they feel like it possibly propelled him to perform, to give us his greatest performance. And so for you, from basketball camp to the many different leagues, did you have to say that you had Tourette's syndrome? Was it something that you wanted to keep to yourself? And were the doctors also like clearing you? Did were there any conflicts between you and the doctors in terms of perform you know, practicing all the time constantly? You talking about more so in the NBA or just period? Period. Uh, no, you know what? I was always taught, you know, my mother never made made my Tourette's syndrome an issue. You know, it's kinda like in the movie Ray. Said, you know, she said, you're not a cripple, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I never, because of the way I grew up and attention really never, we never talked about it. And, and people around me who saw me every day, it became so normal, mm. right? And they just wouldn't even notice it. I could see on their face, they just see right through it. So I, I, it was just always, always in me not to even make it an issue because I didn't want people to feel pity for me. Right. You know, but also... It made me work hard. I knew I had to, you know, work harder to, to in some ways, have people to look at me a little differently, mm -hmm. right? And uh, that, that, that pushed me. But, uh, no, I mean, I was on Haldol. They did put me on Haldol. And Haldol, I, I found out, I mean, it made you want to drink and eat and sleep when you weren't on the move. I started my high school out my senior year at 155. At the end of that year, and I, we played like 41 games. I'm playing most of the games. I mean, most of the minutes. So I ended up being like 172. I get to LSU, Damn. I'm 185. Wow. And I'm like 20-some pounds overweight, averaging 30, 30, 30 a game. I'm, out, I'm literally out of shape. And I found out later that that drug was a psychotic drug. It was They give it to prisoners uh -huh. and people to put them to sleep. Wow. And I was like, darn, I, I'm, we're always taught to carry ourselves with humility, but I'm almost about to reach and pat myself on the back. I said, I did all that yeah. taking how, dog. Yeah. <laughs> and then they put me on Prozac and Prolixin at LSU, and it didn't have the gain weight factor. So I decided, I said, you know what, man, trick this. I'm not, I'm not taking, because all these side effects. I said, I'm just gonna pray. I'm gonna try to eat right. I'm gonna keep training. I'm gonna stay away from negative stress as much as possible. Mm. Watch my surroundings. And ever since then, LSU, I haven't been on anything. Mm. I've been managing. Wow, man, wow. I moved. Um, I would imagine that what kind of response, like uh, around the country, around the world, have you got with other um, other folks in the Tourette's community? Um, I used to be a part of the Tourette's Syndrome Association. Mm -hmm. you know, I did a commercial when I was at LSU, uh, you know, in support of it. And then I used to travel when I was with the league in Sacramento. They have a chapter in DC. They have uh -huh. a chapter. So I did a lot of work with them. I haven't done, unfortunately, a lot of work lately with them. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm still open to it, but I'm always trying to. Uh, be a voice for for things. Not just that. Yeah. Just as so much, I think this is never in the history of this country 
in the world have we experienced the increase that we see with youth with mental challenges and disabilities mm-hmm. and wanting to commit suicide. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's just not, I mean, everybody's dealing with something. How much you think that has to do with the medication? You know what? I think a whole bunch of it. Mm-hmm. Not just medication, though, just Life. there's a reason they call it the Food and Drug Administration. Yeah. What's in the foods mm-hmm. leads you to the pills, and the pills have so many side, side effects. effects. I, my brother's a homeo- homeopath. Uh-huh. So I'm looking in the pharmaceutical book. Everything they got in there, the side effects are like a paragraph. The benefits is like a line. I said, why would I want to take that? And when I was going through the ulcer in Denver, uh-huh. and it didn't dawn, I said, darn, I got a brother, man. Because I, I got an ulcer because I was so angry. And I went to the hospital. They, they gave me an IV. They inject, you know, gave me some stuff. I came back. I said, hey, David, man, this is what I'm going through. He said, read to me what they gave you. I mean, tell me what they gave you. He looked on his computer. He said, you see this, this, and this? That helps your problem. He said, you see this, 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 this? That recalls the problem in the same medicine. Mm. Wow. I said, are you serious? And that's when, yeah. I, that's when I started looking in the industry and uh-huh. even talking about that. I said, I mean, y'all killing folks. Y'all got folks in a cycle. Uh, yeah. Uh, my mood is here, uh, Abdul Raouf. Um, I want to go to song and come back and open the phone lines. Heather B, I know you're headed out to... Urban View, you guys hit me up. I'm at the happy hour, WHB on the gram. All right, uh, we're coming right back. We're taking uh, phone calls, 888-742-3345. Yes, and he's here with us today, Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf. Um, that was Common who came by the show recently. Yep. Um, Jocelyn Rose Lyons, uh, Steven Espinoza from Showtime. These are all close friends of mine. Uh, Sarah Allen, she's from the Bay as well, from Oakland, who's an EP on the project. Um, you guys put together a remarkable project. Uh, we've been having this conversation, um, and, and and we're talking about uh, your career, but your life as well, you know, and you've been very, I don't want to say everything because it's a lot that's said in a documentary, and I want folks to, to hear this, but at one point in your life, uh, you reached a crossroad uh, where you, you you start questioning your faith. You grew up in Christ, You grew up a Christian, mm-hmm. right? Um, what made you question your faith? What was it? You know, there were just some things, man, that you you keep hearing things that just are contradictory. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, you you hear oh, for example, even in terms of prophets, these mm-hmm. are men of God, but then one minute they're committing incest, mm-hmm. and then you know how can you be a man of God? And so, and then just the concept of the Trinity uh-huh. just didn't resonate with me. Um, and then other stories, you know, you, you come across uh, biblically, um, even with, you know, Jesus being crucified. Uh-huh. And then when you read about the upper room and he comes to the upper room and he says, you know, touch me, feel me, because they, they suppose they saw a ghost. He right. said, touch me, feel me, see that it is I myself, or a spirit has no, I said, well, why was he, if he was dead, because he said spirit has no flesh and bones. Uh-huh. How could you see him? And was this after the supposed crucifixion? So, but when I make a long story short, when I'm asking questions, I'm always getting two responses. And I'm not saying this is everybody's experience, but it was well, mine. your personal experience, yeah. And they said, you know what? You just got to believe and you can't question God. I said, but hold on, man. God gives us a mind. What I'm questioning because I want to know. Uh-huh. I want to follow the right way. And so to me, that was unsatisfactory until I was given the autobiography of Malcolm that just caused me to start thinking differently and then pursuing information and not just reading for the sake of reading, engaging it, asking questions, and which led me to meeting a person that's from New York, Mark James, uh-huh. and uh, Islam came up in conversation. I picked up the Quran to go by a lot, of, you know, through a, bypass a lot of the details. Two, three pages later, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I can remember to this day I made me feel. I looked across the table at him. I said, man, I don't know about you. My search is over. Mm. And I said, this is it. And I started going to the masjid. And every day up until now, I'm 53, someone asked me, said, what is it? I said, I'll tell you. From the moment I started to now, every time I engage it, it's never ceased to satisfy my curiosity and answer my questions. Wow. So why wouldn't I? Wow. To this day. So, but... However, I won't even say but, however, that decision you made affected the dream you had to be an NBA player, Mm. right? Yes. Um, Talk about that as that was happening, your relationship with God through Islam. 
and then the relationship you have with the NBA because of it. Yeah. You know, man, reading has a look. There's a saying that, you know, your thoughts influence your behavior. Mm -hmm. Your behavior forms your character and your character determines your fate. And so the more you learn is just it's it's just a natural course of action that is going to change you. And so I began to my the most of my education came from on the road, Mm -hmm. not at college, not in high school. People would meet me at hotels. And I'm a people's person, so I felt if I feel comfortable, I'm inviting to the room. I'm ordering room service. People, there were some people that were great in history, some great in religion, some had a specialty in political science, and they would introduce me to books: Noam Chomsky, Gore Vidal, Howard Zinn, Amos Zinn, Wilson, Kwanzaa Kunju. I'm reading everything now because I feel I'm being exposed, and it's fascinating me. Then I feel cheated mm-hmm. educationally. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, man. And so as a result of that, I come across books talking about foreign policy, talking about the crimes, and then I'm comparing where we are today and I'm listening to the language of what was happening then. It's like, darn, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. You know, nothing. I said, if you take these images in 2023 and you take the images then and you put them in black and white, you wouldn't notice the time difference. Uh-huh. We still, so these That's are- That's interesting. Yeah, these are the things that influenced me. I just couldn't see myself. And so the NBA, Obviously, you know, it, it was less about me. It was more about sending a message uh-huh. to other people, you know, that if this is if you choose to take this course, this is going this is what's going to happen to you. Uh-huh. And they they said I was supposed to meet David Stern uh, that I never talked to David Stern uh, throughout that whole process. The media was saying he's going to New York. Never met him. Uh, and then I come to find out that you're suspending me for not standing for the flag. Now, I don't even think this, I don't know if this is in the documentary, but yet I'm reading this paper. It used to be called a spotlight. Now it's called American Free Press. And they had a private meeting in Davos, Switzerland, you know, the heads of state, presidents. And this is prior to the Iraq war, uh-huh. right? Before they even mentioned it to the public that, okay, we're going to where they already knew. Uh-huh. And the meeting was such that if you had been invited before, you had to pay 10000 to attend. If you have it, 15000 just to attend. The gist of the meeting was to see which major corporations was going to steal the natural resources. They gave a list of the people invited. David Stern, the NBA commissioner, was one of them. I said, wow, hmm. this is going to, that generational effect. Y'all getting ready. There's going to be murder. Yeah. There's going to be theft. And there's generational effects uh-huh. of what you're involved with. And you're going to, no politics. In basketball, you uh-huh. suspending me and and putting me out there like that, and so, yeah, it was it was it was ridiculous. And I, but this is the hypocrisy, yeah, that, that exists. And even today with the NBA, they. But look at themselves. Kyrie Irving. Right. Did you and Kyrie ever have a? Did he reach out to you? Man, I talked to Kyrie uh, during the Big Three. Yeah. Uh, I forget who put us in contact. Man, we talked for about an hour. Very intelligent, articulate guy. And he said, Mahmoud, the takeaways that I have from the conversation, he said, Mahmoud, man, basketball, my legacy is already established. He said, but in, in so many words, he said, man, but that's not important to me. He said, what's, what I'm trying to leave now, man, I'm trying to help as many people as I can. I'm trying to elevate myself. And which is why I think he's on a he's on a tear. Uh-huh. Like that wasn't mentioned about all how phil- philanthropic he is. Uh-huh. You know, because, you know, it's easy now to label you when you don't see all of that as a troubled person. Right, but but he's he's definitely on a course, I think. And on the on the course to trying to educate yourself, look man, you're gonna have missteps. Yeah. That's just natural. Yeah. yeah. But I admire the fact that he's willing to throw things out there to see how it's gonna bounce back. That's how you grow. Uh-huh. And that's what he's doing, I think. And I was very impressed with our conversation. But the NBA, you know, I was asked, Well, if it was a different time now, do you think I said, No, because look at how they did Kyrie, right. it's the different type of politics. Mhm. Uh-huh. You know, when, when James Harden and, and Westbrook were in China, uh-huh. what's happening with the Uyghurs. Uh-huh. And then you have, and they have a facility in, in, in China. And they were about to answer a question, hey, don't answer that. I thought y'all allowed your players to deal with these issues. Uh-huh. You know, so it's not as, I think they're just more savvy with how they deal with it. But because they've just, never reached back to uh, Craig Hodges. You've been uh-huh. having all of these social, if you're no longer like David Stern's period, no, no longer like that. Why haven't you? And you've changed. Why haven't you reached back? I talked to Craig. Uh-huh. 
the position that Craig took by giving the staff recommendations for the black community, every citizen should be able to do. But what happened with Craig Hodges? He after the championship, he went to the White House mm-hmm. wearing African dashiki. I remember this, right? Yeah. And he passed to a staffer to give to the president recommendations to improve conditions in the African American community. Mm-hmm. They felt he shouldn't have did that. No, if you're a qualified leader, you should accept those offers. Yeah. You know, you you come to us to promote you for votes and all this other. Every citizen should have the right to do that. Even if you're not a citizen, God gives you that right mm-hmm. if you see something. Mm-hmm. And so they went around, and his his career was affected as a result of that. Yeah. And so they they, they blackballed him. Yeah. The problem shouldn't have been with him. It should have been with people who saw it as a problem. And like he's broke three. All star records. Yeah. Nobody has done that yet. Three point contest. I said they should have him at every event with a throne at half court until somebody get those until three. Somebody get paying it. him handsomely for it. They should invite him and in, uh, I don't I don't petition for me. Mm-hmm. But they should invite all of those people who stood up for something at these at these conventions talking about social action if you've really changed. But you haven't because it ain't the same type of politics and you haven't changed. I love it, man. My mood is here. Uh, 888-742-3345. Lord Sears coming up next. Uh, We're going to go to Louisiana. Chu, we got to do quick questions. You got one? What up, Chu? I just wanted to give praise to uh, Mahmoud uh, Sway. As you know, uh, Mahmoud, when he when he first got to LSU, um, you know, he he's everybody's favorite player before they were, his, you know, before he was anybody's favorite player. So um, a guy who scored, 48 and 53 in his first month. He put up 55 against his home state team, Ole Miss, hitting nine threes. As as um uh the Splash brother would say, what's his name? Uh, Steph. What? As Steph, Steph and what's say, his name? Uh, oh come wow. on, Chu. Chu, clean it up. Blank, right? Okay, Chu, you know I'm a Warriors I fan. Don't do that. Okay. I, I wasn't doing it on purpose, way I, I couldn't think. But my move, man. I, <laughs> you you were my favorite player uh, when you got to LSU as a kid from out Louisiana. Thank you. Um, you know, I, man, I, I couldn't couldn't wait to till the Tigers came on so I could see you do your thing, man. Uh, much love and and keep doing what you do, man. Thank you. Much love to you. More love to you. True, we appreciate you, man. We got to talk Javante Davis, Ryan Garcia soon. All right. I, I call Friday. I couldn't get off, boy. Okay, family. Have a great day. You a citizen. Let's wait a moment. Uh, Robert, you want to comment? What up, Robbie? He's in Texas. Yes, sir. Yes. Hey, everybody. How you doing? Feeling good. Hey, uh, Mahmoud. Just a uh, quick, quick comment. Hey, a long-time listener, first-time caller. But uh, Mahmoud, I just wanted to say this, man. I was um, uh, stationed in a Keysville Air Force Base back when you were mm-hmm. junior and senior high. I used to watch <laughs> you and Latario Green go at it all the time. Now, um, I also, I have a son that has disabilities, and I'm, all, I'm very sympathetic and protective of people who have uh, disabilities. But I want to tell you that I'm real proud of the way that you're handling this. And I'm uh, just hearing you talk, you know, that, that, just being the spokesman that you are, so to speak. But I just had a quick question as far as, um, um, I know when you, um, you, you converted, you had some trouble, they burnt down your house. How, how did you handle that? And um, did you get any support from the NBA on that? And a much love and much respect to you. Uh, thank you. Um, you know what, man? My faith, even though none of us are perfect, my faith governs everything I do. So, you know, I, I follow the methodology of the Quran everywhere where God says he's going to challenge us. You know, he says, I'm going to challenge you with loss of lives, worldly goods, labors, fruits, but give good news to those who are patient in adversity when they're confronted with a calamity. They say, from God, we come to God, should we belong? He's not going to give you a burden you can't bear. You know, for every difficulty, he's going to give you ease. So I'm always trying to follow up whatever I go through with some positive reinforcement because what you focus on grows. And so that's just how I do it. When I'm hit with something, I say, you know what, you're not going to give me this to dehumanize me. You know, you're giving him this because you're trying to elevate me to something. I don't, might not understand and so that's what got me through it. His house got burned down Wild. in Mississippi, his home state, by some racist folks who they loved him when he was, you know, scoring points for him. But they <laughs> they didn't love him when he decided his faith. Mm-hmm. Right. And they burned down his house. At one point, you became destitute in the sense mm-hmm. that you lost every penny. You know, I'm sure that affected and impacted your family life, yeah. you know, at some point. Um and you'll find out all of these stories. I don't want to tell everything, uh, <laughs> but it's all in a documentary. Um, 
I want to say congratulations to you. I, I don't know why now, but why? But what, what today? What made it happen? What made this doc happen at this time? You know what, man? That's a great question. There's a saying that man plans and God plans, and verily God is the best of planners. Yeah. I would like to think because just the timing. Yeah. Uh, I'm older now. I've I've read more. I've experienced more. Had more conversations. I think I'm in a better position now than I was then to articulate. Uh huh. You know uh, my life, uh, but also just there's always something happening in the world. And with Kaepernick doing what he's doing, look mm -hmm. at Kyrie's situation. Uh -huh. More athletes are speaking out. You know the advancement of social media. You know the media not being able to control the narrative as much as it used to. Uh huh. I just felt this was more better time than any and like an old dude told me he said man none of us are going to make it out of here alive i don't know when i'm going hmm. and so if we can leave a legacy uh you know george washington carver said no one has a right to come into this world and go out of it without leaving behind distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it uh -huh. so sometimes whether it's building a road or a hospital or a book i can be in my 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 on my deathbed i can be in the grave for 50 years 100 years we got a concept in islam called southern Algeria. So if somebody's reading your book and they're benefiting from it, even when you're dead and gone, you're getting blessings. So this is one of the reasons among many that I decided to do it. Man, congratulations, wow. man. That was beautiful. Congratulations to uh, Jocelyn Rose Lyons. Phenomenal. You did an excellent job. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Your direction was um, incredible, impeccable. Mahershala Ali, mm. another Oakland brethren that spoke high praises of you. Jalen Rose, who put things in, in just such a perspective to make you see it so clearly. Shaquille O'Neal, for all of his commentary and just telling people, look, this dude was the greatest. Uh, Stephen Kerr, Steve Kerr, who came in and said he had no chance against you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> All of these legendary people who speak your name, and I'm going to add myself to the list, man. Congratulations. Thank you. Let me say thank you, man. It was an absolute joy watching you play in college. Mm -hmm. It was an absolute joy watching you play. You're the type of player that, even though you didn't play for my team, the Warriors, you actually played <laughs> against them. Um, <laughs> I still enjoyed you playing. And hearing Stephen Curry, Stephen Curry say, uh, how you influenced his game, and, mm -hmm. and in the doc you see clips of you two moving the same. Mm -hmm. What is the greatest game you felt you ever played? What game was it? Oh, man, that's tough. In terms of stats, even though it was an overtime game, I would say Phoenix mm -hmm. because there was a, it was 30-20. Uh, I had 20 assists. Oh, Finally, people – Damn. Yeah. yeah, you know, sometimes you don't get the assist. It ain't because you pass, and it's because they ain't making it. Yeah. You know, they took okay. a dribble. Okay. And yeah. they, they went a certain way, two more dribbles, you know. So, but that, that was uh, one of the best games. But in terms of just numbers, man, I've, I've, I've been blessed yeah. to have a few. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when y'all beat the Bulls, that was a good one. Yeah, but, I, but but you know, Bay Area, man, for me is one of my favorite places. Yeah. Y'all just have a history of art. Y'all have a history of activism. And and that's also a place that just – I used to go in the summer when I was in the league and sit into these meetings and listening to talk, and that helped to, to groom me as well. Okay, he said Locksmith is one of his favorite rappers. <laughs> I Not like bad that. at that. Okay. Yeah. Hey, hey, Mahmoud, thank you for coming by, brother. Thank you. The, the documentary is stand. It's streaming tomorrow on Showtime. Yo, everybody watch Excellent. it, okay?